When I was a college student, I learned about scientists studying language in great apes. And then a friend brought me a book that changed my life. It was Jane Goodall's Reason for Hope. And that led me to the world of Goodall's books, where I learned about how she traveled to the forests of Tanzania to study chimpanzees. I was amazed. There were scientists who spent their lives following animals around and observing their behavior. Goodall discovered that chimpanzees make and use tools and change the definition of what it means to be human. Then I read more. Diane Fossey studied the population of mountain gorillas living in the Rungus Mountains. I learned they might not still be around if it weren't for her. These visible representations of women in science paved the way for so many female scientists, especially female primatologists. As a result, primatology is full of young women students who are eager to follow in their footsteps. And I was one of them. I traveled to Nicaragua, where I took a field course and got to observe howler monkeys and fell in love with watching primates. I traveled to the forests of Cameroon, where I surveyed chimpanzees and gorillas. I interned at primate sanctuaries where I worked with captive gibbons and capuchin monkeys. And I traveled to Little Island off the coast of Puerto Rico where I studied rhesus macaques. But it was spider monkeys that I fell in love with. After working with captive spider monkeys who had once been kept as pets, I wanted to understand the natural social development that these poor monkeys had missed out on. So I went to graduate school and spent years traveling back and forth to Costa Rica to study spider monkey social development and friendship. But my perspective on my old heroes started changing when I was teaching a primate behavior class for the first time at Wake Forest University. There, the library had a special collection of primary source documents collated by one of Fossey's biographers. I was excited to incorporate them into a class project. But then, a student of mine came across a letter. It was written by Fossey to another primatologist, Dr. Richard Rangham. In that letter, Fossey documented her active conservation methods to deter poaching. Chillingly, she described kidnapping and torturing local people. And worse, she was advocating for other primatologists to do the same. This started a journey for me in trying to understand why we aren't always taught these full histories. I want to know who gets to be our conservation heroes. And who are the people behind these stories that get left out? As I learned just last summer, it turns out Goodall wasn't the first to discover chimpanzees using tools. The earliest discoveries and descriptions of tool use date back to the 1600s. And Goodall's ability 
to get funding and access to study chimpanzees was in part due to being a British white woman, just as Tanzania was transitioning from being a British colony to being its own independent nation. The fields of primatology and broader international wildlife conservation are dominated by white Americans and Europeans. And this is in part due to the fact that these fields require so much unpaid labor. Just to prove yourself and get a foot in the door. It's because you need to access those right networks to get paying jobs, graduate programs, and research opportunities. And these societal dynamics mirror the way our society treats promising white students who are mentored to become promising white scientists because they're the ones that are seen as having the most potential. While the rest of us have to struggle just a little harder or a lot just to prove to our white supervisors or colleagues that we actually belong or that our ideas have value. There are many people in Central and South America, Africa, and Asia, all the places where primates actually live in the wild, who can't access these networks, and as a result, are often shut out of conservation decision-making. So, conservation is often run by foreign affluent outsiders who could afford to travel internationally to volunteer or spend years interning at zoos just to access those right prestigious networks in order to obtain these positions of conservation power. If you've grown up far away from primate habitats, it's easy to blame local people for conflicts between people and wildlife without recognizing the global economic pressures that shape these dynamics. It's easy to blame poaching or deforestation on people halfway around the world and assume they just don't care about the animals and then donate to feel-good conservation organizations that frame the donors, the organizers, and foreign conservation experts as the heroes saving endangered wildlife. But the reality is, we all play a role in networks of global product consumption. And it's the actions that many of us do every single day that contribute to deforestation and exacerbate tensions between people and primates. For example, take the tea and coffee you drink. That comes from wildlife habitat across the globe. The bananas and pineapples we eat often come from land in Central America that was once rainforest, where capuchin monkeys and spider monkeys used to live. Colton, the mineral in our laptops and our cell phones that conducts the charge, is mined in the rainforest of Central Africa, where endangered gorillas are struggling to survive. And the palm oil in our chips and cookies and Easy Mac is driving orangutans in the rainforests of 
Southeast Asia to extinction. These product consumption habits harm both local people and local wildlife. As people struggle to feed and support their families, while wildlife are pushed from dwindling habitats further into villages and farms and towns. Some of these networks of product exploitation have their root in colonial rule. Our European nations exploited people and labor for things like tea and sugar. Others are due to more recent new colonial exploitation to meet current rising global product demands for things like palm oil and convenience food and Colton for cell phones. And it's local people who share their ecosystems with the animals that have the knowledge and the insight on how to best manage these issues, which often requires improving human health safety, and economic security. But for foreign researchers coming in, sometimes it's easy to focus on these local pressures without addressing the larger global economic pressures. And increasingly, things like tourism and the popularity of wildlife selfies is contributing to the problem. So our science needs to change. And our conservation funding structures needs to change. And our consumption habits need to change. The good news is there are things that all of us can do to start to fix these problems. First, Consider the products you buy and eat and consume, from coffee to bananas, to the palm oil in your ramen, and the minerals in your phone. What ways are you personally endangering primates? Consider the pictures and videos that you share on social media. Pictures and videos of primates interacting with humans or in human environments fuels the pet trade and increases the exploitation for tourist photo opportunities. Consider the nature documentaries you watch. Who are the presenters they show? Who are the scientists they show? Are they highlighting local conservationists? Or are they presenting foreign scientists as the heroes saving endangered wildlife? And if you donate to a conservation organization before you're swayed by a cute picture on the website, do a little research. Who comprises their board? Who leads their conservation projects? And instead of donating to large-scale, big conservation programs, consider instead donating to smaller, locally-run projects, including humanitarian projects, which can often have a bigger impact. We all play a role in deforestation and endangering primates, and it is our daily habits that contribute to their decline. So we all need to be part of the solution. And foreign scientists, conservation donors, and conservation organizers all need to recognize that we should be supporting local conservation leaders in conserving primates, instead of assuming that we know better than they do. Conserving primates requires all of us. But the best thing that those of us can do in places far away from primate habitat is to start with changing our habits at home. 
Thank you.